Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Christy Moon. I'm a member of the benefits team working on programs for families and parents, which a lot of folks here are parents, so great to see you. Um, I'm happy to be here to introduce Dominica Catelli. Um, before we get started, just a few things to cover. There's definitely some extra books over there if people are interested. Um, we'll also have 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions, so if you have any, jump up to the mic there um, when we have that session. And for folks on VC, because I know we have a couple offices joining, um, if you do have questions, just ping Mina H. And also, we will have a book signing after the talk, um, right over here, where Dominica is sitting. Great. So this talk is actually part of a health, um, health at Google, a speaker series brought on by Optimize Your Life. How many folks know what Optimize Your Life is? Can anybody shout out what it is? You said you knew it, right? Optimize Your Life, right, so health and wellness programs. Um, so we're actually looking for wellness champions across different offices, so if you're interested in helping put on events like this or different programs, let us know. Um, and to see all of our upcoming speakers and topics, check out goto slash OIL. So now I'm pleased to introduce Dominica. Um, do you guys all, do folks know her from Momalicious, blogs, and so on? Yeah, okay. Um, so she's positively influenced the way millions of families eat and prepare food across the U.S. Um, and she really has a lot of tasty, easy, and healthy approaches to cooking. So one of her big claims to fame uh, is getting kids to eat rare vegetables like Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, all of that stuff without, letting, without hiding the ingredients. So that's the big thing there, right? Um, she was selected as the national spokesperson for the Organic Trade Association's 2008 national campaign, Go Organic, for Earth Day. Um, she's a recurring judge on Iron Chef America, a guest on Oprah and Friends. Um, she's been on the Dr. Oz XM radio show, and she's been featured in lots of different uh, publications, including Vegetarian Times, Kiwi Magazine, and Oprah.com. She's among a select few accomplished chefs entrusted to cook for celebrities such as Oprah Winfrey, Montel Williams, and George and Barbara Bush, so pretty high honor. Uh, her first cookbook, Momalicious, Fresh, Fresh, Fast Family Food for the Hot Mama and You, was published in the fall of 2007 and was an instant hit across the nation. So with that... Wow, it is so exciting to be here and a, a, definitely a little bit surreal. I've seen Google on TV over the, I mean, besides being on the internet, but seeing your offices on TV and it's so much, uh, so much bigger and better than I could have even did I lose it? No. Okay, there we go. So just a couple things I want to start out with that The Real doesn't talk about and let you know where I'm at today and what I'm doing as a chef and a busy parent, like many of you are. I know that a lot of people in the audience today are parents or some that aren't. If you're not, I have tips for you too. You don't have to be a parent to get in the kitchen and be busy and need to have some takeaways to start eating healthier at home now. So what I do right now is I just moved back to California a little over a year ago. I was in Texas for about 10 years and I was traveling all over the country, but I was originally from Northern California, a small little town in Geyserville. Has anybody ever heard of Geyserville? Okay, a few of you out there, great. I mean, it's population 1,200. And if you blink on your way driving north on the 101 after you pass to Hillsburg, you will have driven through Geyserville. So it's a beautiful town. If you haven't been, please come and visit. We, my brother and I just reopened our family's restaurant that had been in our families from 1935 until the mid-80s last year. So I grew up in an Italian-American family in the Geyserville area and the surrounding areas. So my grandparents came from Italy, opened this little restaurant in 1935, and at that time, the 101 ran directly through Geyserville. It didn't pass by, so people traveling, people traveling north and south would stop in and eat. And then also all the winemakers from that area who were ranchers, grape growers, that's who I grew up with. They would go and grow their grapes and come in with dirt on their boots and have lunch. And it was before Sideways and before you know, the big advent of wine being as great and cool as it is now from California. So this was just the world that I got to grow up in, which was such a blessing. So when we got the opportunity and heard that the restaurant that was leasing this old building from my dad was leaving their lease 10 years early, my dad called me up and said, they're leaving, what do you think? And I called my brother, said, what do you think? And bless you, he said, let's do it. And then I talked to my husband who's in finance and said, oh my gosh, we get to you know, have this opportunity. And he's like, you're crazy, it's the worst business in the world. 
And so I was like, but it's a dream. We got to make this happen. So we did. And it's been fantastic. So although I am a chef and obviously I'm in the kitchen every day, cooking for guests that come in and cooking for my family are different. Cooking at home is different. So you guys are busy at work all day long and have such a, a phenomenal experience in the fact that you could pretty much go like this and you have great food in your hands. It's like to see that, that everywhere, you know, the 100 feet rule that you have, that you can have amazing snacks and food available to you is, is wonderful. But I want to know what happens when you go home. Because I know that most of you can't really just go like this and have that same experience, <laughs> that everything's prepped and ready, and you may be tired, your partner's tired, and your kids are cranky, and you still want to feed them. And so what are, what's going on in your kitchen? Is there things that are preventing you outside of time limits that are keeping you from cooking to the extent that you can? So what I want to start out with is we're going to do a little assessment. I want you to bring me into your kitchen. I want you guys to take a minute and kind of do some sort of kitchen meditation. Think about your kitchen. Think about your space. And I'm going to introduce you to my cousin, Celia, who is my business partner in Momalicious. She is one of the busiest moms I know. She got her PhD by the time she was 30 with two kids. She's a powerhouse. And she wasn't a foodie. And when I set out to write Momalicious, part of that was from working with moms and people all over the country who wanted the tips, they wanted the recipes, they wanted to know how to make it easier. So Celia and I came together and she was the guinea pig for me. Like I said, okay, I, there's things I take for granted that I know about that you probably all do the same in your work that are you know, jargon that you have that to other people sounds foreign. So I had to make sure that someone who was a busy mom could do this busy dad, busy person. He wasn't a foodie. So that's where Celia came in, and I'm going to pass her over to you real quick. Thanks. Can you help pass these out? Yeah. Thanks. Um, so if you got your survey, please don't start it yet, because I have a couple things I want to say about it. Um, and first of all, I, everything Dominica has said is true. Uh, three years ago, I didn't know what a shallot was. I didn't care to know what a shallot was. Um, I had no idea why I hated my knives. Um, so <laughs> she really has completely transformed me. I cook every meal. I cook breakfast, lunch, and dinner for my family. They love it. It's fast. I'm awesome, I have to say. <laughs> Thanks to Mom Alicious. <laughs> so please take this book literally read it page by page, do all the recipes, and you will also be awesome. Um, what we decided to do, because we know that you're th of the smartest people on the planet, we wanted to take you out of this environment and really bring you back into your kitchens and, and start to assess uh, the areas that are stopping you from really loving cooking. So while you're filling this out, really quick, are there any couples in the audience that are sitting together? Okay, don't share each other's information. We've done this before and it lands in a full-blown fight about, yeah, so, so don't share. Uh, the other thing is at the very end of the survey, we're gonna ask you to really think about the number of minutes that you are cooking in the kitchen. Um, when you're doing that, please don't pad your answer. <laughs> don't feel guilty and think I should be doing more, so I'm gonna add 10 minutes, just to be honest. Um, this only takes about one minute, so go ahead and start. Thank you so much. And those of you on VC, we do have this survey for you um, as an attachment. So Mina says she will send that out to you after the presentation. Do we have it on the slide? And we also have it on the slide. We'll go ahead and put it up if that helps.
I really want to make sure you get to that very last question on the number of minutes. I'll give you a few more seconds. Oh, thank you. Yeah, there, uh, one of the questions was, what, what does cooking time actually mean? And uh, we had a question last time we did this, if cereal in the bowl and putting the milk is considered cooking time, and the answer is no. So, um, and, and no microwave meals. <laughs> yeah, change your answer. <laughs> Okay, and when you're done, the last thing I want you to do is circle the answers that had the lowest uh, assessment. So the ones that you put blah on, circle those areas. If you have too many of them, circle your top three. Okay, Who's, who wants to start by telling me what your biggest blah area was? Yes, what's your name? Janelle. Janelle. Janelle, knives, you are not alone. And I have, we have really good knife solution and tips coming up. Awesome. Anyone else? Any blahs? Oop. Pantry. Pantry. So is the pantry what's in your pantry or the fact that it's disorganized? Disorganized. disorganized. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a big stopping point for a lot of people. You feel overwhelmed when you look in there, so it's like avoid it at all costs. Spice cabinet. You don't have one. You have no spice cabinet. Okay. No spices at all. <laughs> so you're. So it's the lack of the spice cabinet on what's in the spice. The fact that there is not a spice cabinet. You have salt. You have salt. Okay. <laughs> you have the basic. You started. You have the building block. Salt. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Okay, so you're lacking, so you have the appliances, but you don't have enough counter space to do everything around them. Okay. No, no, I don't have the appliances, but they don't the counter space. You, I have, I don't have, you have counter space, no counter space and no appliances? Right, I have a microwave and a toaster, and that's all that fits. Okay. Yeah, I don't have so if you add anything no extra. Nobody's no coffee no, no, nothing. Okay. <laughs> Is there room for an island? Or a little, a, a small, a tiny island. Okay. Yes. Spice cabinet. Okay, so your spice cabinet issue isn't that you don't have one, it's that you have random things that you, so let me ask you a question. The spices that you bought for a recipe that you haven't used since, what's the time period that you bought those spices? Are we talking about in the last few weeks, the last few months, few decades? Years. If you, if you can see the dust, you just throw it out. Okay, so I'm actually just going to tackle that one right now. It could come into ingredients. I was going to talk about ingredients later, but it's just such a, a passion for mine. So, for me, that concept of dust on top of the spices, actually, if it's got to the point that there's actually dust on top of the spices, it became dust way before that. So the misnomer that a spice lasts forever, like, oh, this was passed down to me from my grandmother, <laughs> that does not work. The, really, spices have a lifespan, and after that lifespan, you are adding colored dust to your food. So it's really important that if you ha when you get your spice cabinet, that you keep it in rotation. And I'll tell you some tips on that in a bit of ways to bring things in, keep the cost down, and keep the things rotating through there. So we got spices, we got lack of space, we have disorganization, knives, any, anything else yet? Okay, so you have nothing in your pantry. <laughs> so the spice, and the, so you guys get together and you have an empty kitchen. <laughs> All right, yes, yeah, so that's, that is important to have some things to cook with in order to, to cook. So the good news is, is the first um, chapter in Momalicious is what to get out and what to bring in. So you don't have to worry, you can just skip over what to kick out of your pantry, so you got, you're halfway done. And then it's the simple things of what you wanna have in stock, in your refrigerator, in your freezer, in your pantry that's gonna make cooking easy and enjoyable and healthy. So one of the places I want to start with you guys is 
the tools. So this goes to, this will work for you because this is all under counter space. These are things you can store and then you're gonna bring up to actually cook with. So what I find, and I, I cook all over. So I've gone from you know, going into someone's dorm apartment to do a little assessment for them and say, what can you do in this tiny little space? So I've worked in spaces that are this small to people who have ginormous kitchens as big as this whole room and figure out you know, how to make that space work as well and not get lost in your kitchen. So what I find is if you have a few things that are stocked and ready to roll that you don't cringe when you bring them out to use them, you don't wonder if they're gonna break off in your hand or they're halfway melted, it's actually gonna make the process that much more enjoyable. And so for me, it would be starting with what I call, I'll call it the Momalicious Survival Kit, is these four, actually five things, I'm missing ones over here. So what we have here is a rimmed baking sheet. Anyone know why, why rimmed? Things don't fall off. Exactly, so things don't fall off because what this is in my house, this isn't, this isn't spend much time making cookies. This is all about one dish dinners. That is what I use this for. Line it with a piece of parchment or a piece of tin foil and fish goes on one side, veggies on the other, and then it's into the oven and it's out and usually 10 minute dinners on this, on this roast a whole sheet of veggies and then after time over time if they get really kind of funky and worn out they turn into my ones i use on the grill because i use my outside grill with the lid as an oven as well when it's hot so then the you, the worn out one of these go out to the grill okay the other another essential is a good cutting board so i cannot tell you how many places from that span of kitchens from the little tiny in dorm kitchen to the giant one, that when I go to make something and cut it, there's this teeny tiny little glass or plastic cutting board. Glass or marble, I, I haven't quite figured it out why that became a cutting board trend. It's great if you wanna put a piece of cheese on it or something fancy to look at, but to actually cook your dinner and cut on that is one of the first ways you're gonna wear out and have a bad knife and be really frustrated with your knives. So next, and actually this should be number one on the list, is having a good knife. And I don't mean, yes? So having a good knife, do you guys like shop for that? Okay, she said, where do I shop for a good knife? I always get cheated, wow. Where are you shopping that you're getting cheated? <laughs> Walmart or Target? Walmart or Target, okay, yes. Well, we'll address that part in a second. So for me, Having one good knife, I like this size in particular. This is an eight inch. I don't think you want anything below a six inch. If you're gonna have one knife, have it be a, a bigger knife like this because you can cut smaller things, you can cut bigger things. You don't need to invest $1,200 into a giant knife block. If you have that, that's great. But also, I'm having feedback, sorry. If you fell prey to one of those late night infomercials that you can get this kit and it's gonna cut through a can and then you're gonna cut through everything, you've been misled. So usually if you cut through a can, it's you're not gonna go cut through a piece of fish or cut through herbs in the same way because a serrated knife, most of those knives are serrated and you're not gonna use a serrated knife to chop. It doesn't work the same way. So for me, Personally, my favorite knives that I use right now that are accessible are Shun. You can get them at Williams Sonoma or Sur La Tab. They are a bit more pricey, but they have sales on them. And if you're investing in one knife and what you're gonna do with that, you can get a good knife for under $100. You can go to places like, like this knife, a traveling knife of mine is a Calphalon knife that I got at TJ Maxx, and I think that I paid $18 for this knife. So you want a stainless carbon blade that you can actually sharpen, and we'll go into that in a bit. So that's something to look for. So the places like uh, kitchen stores that, are, that have knives like Wusthof or Shun or any of those, you can't go wrong. You could talk to someone there and pick out one good chef knife. You can also put that on your Christmas list to, you know, an in-law or your spouse or something that's gonna be, you're gonna have used that way more there than the sweater that you might have seen that seems really cool right now, but that's gonna be in a box in two years. You will have that knife for, for years and years. It doesn't seem like such a romantic gift, but it can be. <laughs> <laughs> Microplane, does anybody have one of these at home? 
I see more and more hands going up for this over the years. A few years ago when these were you know, first coming out, not so much, but this is a great tool in Grader, and it's so easy to use. So if you ever grate, my favorite thing to grate on this is Parmesan cheese. It's, you can have kids grate cheese on there if they're at a certain age. You, know, you don't want to be careful of their fingers, but it's so easy. It's You don't struggle with it. My other most favorite thing to use this for is for citrus, for zest. So for lemons, for lime, and that's going to add flavor into your food so quickly, and we'll touch on that a little bit more as well. And then I just always love having a good pair of tongs. This is like another set of hands. You can get, I can stir things, get things done, but you, what you want to look for, for that I like is these are heat proof and then the rubber handle. These are my favorite kind because they don't get stuck either. If you get cheap tongs, don't bother because what they do is they jam up and then you're, they're useless and then they just sit in your drawer and they annoy you. So those are five great tools that I think are a great place to start. Next place, this is going into the issues with the spices and the pantry is ingredients. Ingredients are, I want to okay, can we not have that there? Okay, so what's in your refrigerator, what's in your pantry, all of those things really make a big difference on how much you're cooking, what you're cooking, how you feel after you're cooking. So for you, I wanna address the spice thing right away. So for going to, this answers both of your questions, is one of my favorite place to get spices is in the bulk department. So if you are, if you have a Whole Foods nearby or even some of the major grocery stores, they actually sell spices in bulk, so they just have the big wall of them, and you can buy the smallest amount that will literally add, sometimes they can't even, it doesn't even register on the scale, it's like two cents, because it's so, you need so little of it, and again, we wanna keep those things fresh. You don't want, if you're gonna get a giant jar of something that's in, there's a teaspoon, in a recipe and then you know that you're going to be using that you know probably once every few months it's going to go bad and you just paid seven dollars for something for a teaspoon of something where you can go and literally pay a nickel 20 cents for these bags of spices and things that you use more often I use cumin a lot in my house and in cooking I could all get a quarter cups worth and it's still probably at least 60% less expensive than buying it in a jar. So use old jars, use old spice jars, you can rinse them out, all those dust collectors, dust them off, run them through the dishwasher, fill them back up. So right now they're gonna be passing around, um, Mina and Celia are gonna be passing around an olive oil sample. So these are two extra virgin olive oils that I got at Safeway. And there is a substantial difference in olive oil. This is one of the baseline, base ingredients that I cook with and I think that this is what can make or break a dish. When you use a cheap oil or if you don't fall prey to the extra virgin light olive oil, that is not, that's just a crazy branding thing. There's no such thing as light olive oil. All that is is olive oil that's been blended down with junk oil to make it light and then they charge more for it. So you want a good cold pressed extra virgin olive oil. That's not only is it good for you health-wise, it really makes a difference in the flavor of your food because when you're dealing with a good olive oil, it's a vehicle for flavor. I can bake with a good extra virgin olive oil and you don't taste olive oil. If I'm making a lemon cake, the lemon tastes that much more lemony. If I make something with chocolate, the chocolate's that much more punched up. However, in that same situation, if you're using an oil that's not a quality oil, all you taste is that funky, like rancidy taste. So, okay, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna get two cups. One's gonna be lighter, one's gonna be darker. Taste the lighter one first if it's not too late. Take a teeny sip and then breathe in while you're doing it, kind of like if you've ever tasted wine and you do that whole thing. So do that and swallow and then wait a minute and I know it's not the best flavor in the, on its own. And then you're gonna do it with the darker one. Has everyone done it? Okay, so the lighter one. I know what I'm. Oh. There you go. Tell me your name. Maureen. Maureen. Okay, Maureen nailed it on the head. The second one you should taste. Woo, it's peppery too. <clears throat> The second one you're gonna taste, pep it's grassy and it's kind of peppery, it's got that heat. That's what you want. So on its own, the other one might taste kind of like more mellow and all that, but that's gonna have this 
fun, it's funky. You want olive oil is a live product. It should be have that peppery finish. So that means it's fresh, it's good. It means the olives have been picked when they're still on the tree and then pressed. So that's where you get that pepperiness from because it's alive. If you go somewhere a la Costco and you can get you know, a keg of olive oil, extra virgin olive oil for $5, I guarantee you you're not getting a quality extra virgin olive oil because it's just, you can't do it. So both of those are from the grocery store. Um, the one, the lighter one was a Bertoli Celia, is that right? Okay, so that was the one. Lucini is the one, the darker uh, colored one, and I buy that at grocery stores all over the country. There's also a California, a newer California oil, Miller's, Miller's Cross? I don't want to, is that right? Miller's Crossing? That sounds like a film, I think it is. Okay, <laughs> um, it's really grassy and peppery as well. So I've seen it in a lot of the regular grocery stores, so those are ones that I would use. I'm not sure about, I know Trader Joe's has a bunch of different ones, but I, I don't know which out of their oils are the, the better ones. Yes? If you have, she asked if there is a range of when spices go bad and, and that there's things that are years old <laughs> right there. Years, yeah, years is too old. One of the, um, there was a food show I was at and there's a spice line, um, Morton and Ballard, I think it is, they have a blue top and they did this great um, spice comparison side by side and even with newer spices and j that you can smell and see the difference like that cinnamon could have barely any residue left of smelling like cinnamon and then when you have a f more fresher ground one it's just night and day but something like a cinnamon or a turmeric or the, some of those more intense ones have a stronger and oils can last a bit longer but smell it and you really should be able to smell whatever it is if it's you know white pepper or ba I don't recommend dried herbs such as basil or tarragon or any a lot of those the the actual herbs cuz those are you know the leaves that are dried and crown they don't their oils don't hold up as well rosemary is more intense so if you have a recipe that calls for some dried ground rosemary that's one that you can get away with a bit more but a lot of the the these type of more leafy herbs don't hold up well in a, in a dried form Yes. Absolutely grate your fresh nutmeg on demand, and you're going to do it on your microplane grater. So yes, you can have one nutmeg. Nutmeg is one of those things that I have not tested the lifespan of. I feel like it can last a lot longer when it's not ground, because that's what we use at the restaurant. We just have a big jar of nutmegs, and they have just little hard nuts, and then you grate them on here, and it's great flavor, super easy. And I highly recommend grading it if you can. I saw another hand. Well, yes. You know, that again, I don't, I've not tested out how much longer nutmeg could go on ground, but I, I know it has a significantly longer time than when you actually. Um, have it ground. So give it a whirl on your microplane. <laughs> okay, so ingredients. So we've got everyone. Did everyone notice the difference in the two flavors of oils? Yeah. yeah. Did you, how many people preferred the lighter one? A few of you. Okay. <laughs> And, and I would, uh, the lighter one, like I said, it doesn't have as strong a flavor when you have it on its own. What the difference is, if we cooked something with those two oils side by side, you would see a tremendous difference. Oh, yes? When you toss the salad? So with an oil like this, with this, it's got that more peppery, grassy flavor. When you start mixing in the other things of the salad, it's you're not going to get that he, intense heat like we did and that intense pepperiness when you're just eating you know sucking it in raw with air so once you start mixing all those other items that are in your salad whether it's you know tomatoes or vinegar and all of that what it's going to do is go back to what I was talking about is really punch up those flavors so it will carry everything through more and when you have a lower quality oil it's just kind of going to sit on there and be heavy you'll end up tasting that more than you would that so skills, 
Here's the next part of what I find is one of the big holdups for people in the kitchen is that either you were so busy at work and you removed the mystery <laughs> thing, it's still going. I know. I feel like I'm on a, it sounds like a foghorn, like I'm coming in, the ship's coming in. I'll go back out here for a minute. So there's a few easy skills that if you aren't doing, you're gonna take away tonight, and I think will make a big difference for you in the kitchen. But I'm gonna need some help on this, and one of these you actually already saw on TV, so I need uh, someone out there who's willing to come up and raise your hand. Yeah, you're, okay. You're right there. You're these... Tell me your name. Jim. Jim. Okay. I'm Dominica. Nice to meet Thanks you. Thanks for being here. Come on around. Can you hold this for me? Okay, sure. Years of training. It's <laughs> real important. There we go. <laughs> Purple's your color, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> That's on YouTube for eternity. Okay, so one of the things that you might have seen in the reel that I think is one of the best time-saving tips is pounding your chicken. Do any of you pound chicken? Right on. Okay, so as you know, not only does it save time, it also gets out a lot of the day's frustration. Not on your family, but on the chicken. This is also great if you have teenagers or younger kids who can handle this. This is a good thing to put them on too, so they could get that out on the chicken instead of their siblings. So what, why we do this is because it A, cuts down the cooking time, it can tenderize it, but you can you know, really be having dinner, pound it out, go into the oven on the table in about 15 minutes if you do this whole process. So I'm gonna give it the first whack and then it's gonna be all about you, okay? You will hold this for me again? Sure. Okay, wait. Can you hear me if I just talk real loud? Okay. So, oh, thank you. So what you don't wanna do is go, you hit it so hard that you go all the way through and you make holes in it. So we're trying to get it down to a little, um, about a little less than a half an inch thick. And there's different types of mallets. So there's this side that's for tenderizing more beef and other, you're not gonna use that on the chicken side and you'll rip through the bag. You have a flat side and there's also the big wood ones that have a, a broader surface. Those are really nice as well. You, you actually cover more area at once. So you're just gonna hit it like that and then pound it all the way through, okay? Flat side only. Flat side only, yes. You don't know what happens if you hit it with the other side. So he's doing a perfect job. You just need some spices. <laughs> so what, the good thing about doing this in a, uh, a bag, if you do a bunch of these, so you pound them out, you have them in there, and then you can take and marinate them actually in the bag and have them ready to go on the grill, in the oven, it's done. Or you can just throw them into the refrigerator and have them ready. Look at that. I'm trainable. You sure are. I think you're almost done. Yeah, you want it to be as even as you can so you don't have some parts that are crispy and some parts that are, or I guess if you do want some parts that are crispy and some parts that aren't, then you could do that. Let me see. Look at that. And see how much further that uh, actually spreads out the portion size too. So sometimes, thank you. Great job. Here, I have your own special mallet for you. You don't have any spices yet, but you do. You're going to have a mallet. So I Here, can smash the spices, right? You can. You, can. you actually could. Hey, that's a actually a really good tip. So, you know, but if you have spices like, or like black peppercorn or coriander or seeds, you could put them in a bag with this side and then hit through the bag. And then you could do, make your own personally smashed. So this is going to be a signed mallet. This is going to be a signed mallet. Great job. There you go. Thank you. Oh, but you can't have my apron. I, so sorry. Okay. I have so, I have one of these already. You do. <laughs> Yours is all pink though, isn't it? Okay, so now we've got our chicken pounded out, and I need uh, another volunteer to come up. Anybody else want to come up? Tell me your name. Mark. Mark. What am I getting myself into? Mark, you're getting yourself into an apron. <laughs> we already know that. It's a really. I just wanted to wear the apron. I know. I, there's going to be a long line up. If you want to wear the apron after and have your picture in it, we can have an apron booth. Okay, here we go. You know the drill. Yeah. 
Okay. One of the things I skipped over on the important kit over there is one of these juicers. Do any of you have this at home? A couple of you? Okay, so this is fantastic for everything from margaritas to your dinner. So what this is, is simply a juicer. It's a lemon juicer. They also sell a little green one that's a lime juicer. Don't get sucked in. I mean, if you like gadgets, that's fine, but really a lime fits inside the lemon one and you don't have to take up more space. I don't know what that's about. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take this lemon. How do you feel about using knives? I'm good. Okay, I'm trusting you. Actually, hold this really quick. I'm gonna... So since we're on skills, and you have your sharp knife at home now, one of the things that I want to remind everyone of when you're working with knives, one, if you have a dull knife, you're much more likely to cut yourself. I don't know if you know that or not, but dull knives slip off of things and go into digits really easily. The other thing is, is when you're cutting, I always see a lot of balancing and this when I'm talking to people and they're trying to cut. Can you guys all see that? Like there's a lot of, when people hold things, they tend to go hold like this. You want to pull back your fingers. So everyone put your hands up like this, sideways. So do this, and this is what you're gonna, you're gonna use your knuckles as the pressure. So when you're holding on to things, so if you do happen to go this way, you're either gonna hit into your knuckle or you're gonna miss your finger. So just cut through. Now I'm gonna give you your own lemon. And let's see if you were paying attention. Oh, show off on a lemon. Yes, on a lemon. We are working with a smaller piece of produce here. If that was something that was a bit bigger, I would like to see you use that same technique. Okay, so here we go. Let's put your lemon in. No. Mm. I guess the juice has to come out. The juice has to come out, correct. So the holes are at the bottom, so it goes... I know, it doesn't, it's not, I can't explain it. It's, it's gravity, it's technology, I don't know, it's a mystery juicer. So there you go. So that's going to push into there and watch how much juice comes out of here. Here, well, here, wait, wait, let me, we're going to lose the bag. There we go. There we go. Usually at home you're not holding a microphone when you're cooking, so it works out a lot better. There we go. Keep going. All the way. Just, there you go. So one whole lemon could do just about four to six chicken breasts. Was that not easy? Cool. So it's that simple. And adding, just adding fresh citrus into your food, whether it's salads, whether it's proteins, whatever it is, it's gonna add significant flavor. It's not gonna add calories. Lemon's really good at keeping your body alkaline. So it's a great thing and I don't think, that enough of us are eating, having that proper amount of citrus, meaning lemons, meaning limes, and just keep a basket, have one of these at home, and quick, quick, great flavor. Okay, this one's for you. Awesome. Do you have one of these at home? I don't. Okay, good, because then I might have to have to, have to someone else. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, Thank wait. You. See, the apron. Perfect. So this is, as you can see, how easy that was. You pound out some chicken, you can add some fresh lemon juice, some fresh lime juice, put a little olive oil in there. You can add fresh herbs. That's one of my favorite things to have in the kitchen. You can either have a pot on your countertop if you, can, if you have room for that. I, I know that you don't, can't have room for a toaster, so I'm not going to ask you to put a pot of herbs, but if you have a room, a little patio or garden, they will last you for months. Very easy to upkeep. If not, they're inexpensive, and the places that you, you can use them, a lot of times I find people say, well, I bought a, you know, a thing of herbs because I was making a recipe and it had a tablespoon of basil, fresh basil, and the rest wilted. You can take your basil leaves and use them on a sandwich. We'll bring them to work with you and we'll use them on the sandwich that you reach out for. I just realized that. <laughs> okay, at home over the weekend, add these to a turkey sandwich. Add them to a BLT. Tear up your leaves and put them into your salad. They'll just instant flavor, super easy, and they don't have to just be cooked into something. So fresh herbs are fantastic for that. Another great thing, so you have your chicken pounded, you put your lemon juice, some olive oil. If you do have spices that aren't a million years old, but you per, mixes and rubs, things that you've been sitting there that you're like, oh, I'm not doing a whole pork that I'm gonna rub down. Take that and throw it into a bag with chicken. Shake it up, 
that's your own little shake and bake, and then throw that into the oven. So lastly, if you're gonna take some of these skills, so whether it's you know, using your juicers, using your pounding chicken, using your knife and not cutting off your fingers, is some of the techniques. So for me, one of the keys to eating weeknight meals, quickly getting the kids food on the table for the kids, is high heat, less time. One of the biggest mistakes I see and why people all the time say, oh my gosh, my chicken always turns out rubbery, it's, I don't like it, it's dry, it's because it's been cooked on too low of a heat for too long. So a lot of times I hear 300, 350, no. You're looking at 450 degrees or your broiler. So a piece of chicken like that on a sheet pan like that, lined in parchment with all its stuff on it, and that oven is smoking hot. It goes in there, and it's going to be done in five to seven minutes, and it's not going to be dried out. If you leave it in for 12 to 15, it will be, because if you have something that's that thin, then that's going to be the problem. Also, when you have a thicker cut of meat, what happens is it's in there, and it just all the moisture drains out. And a really big reason for that a lot of times is you're going with your meats or your proteins straight from the refrigerator into the oven. And what happens when you do that is that your meat is so cold and the oven's so hot, but that's, everything's draining out. So what you want to do is you want to bring your meats as close to room temperature as you can, unless, you're, unless your kitchen's 90 degrees. I'm, not, I'm talking like reasonable room temperature, like not straight out of the refrigerator, but letting it sit out for five minutes to 20 minutes or so before it cooks, depending on what the cut of meat is and what it is. The only thing that doesn't apply to is fish. Fish you want to keep cold, fish cooks in a lot less time. But things like pork or lamb or chicken, if you have them not straight out of the refrigerator and then they go onto the grill or go into the oven, you will see the, a tremendous difference in moisture and how much more juicy that, that food is. So that's another little uh, helpful tip. And what I want to do also is ask, open up to more questions if there's anybody who has more mystery ingredients or stressors or I don't want to go near that or also actually because we were talking earlier before some of you guys got here I wanted to share I had the question of how do you feel about hiding so if any of you guys have kids not hiding in general hiding food sorry <laughs> actually hiding in general I don't think is a good thing so at the baseline with food if you are um, fallen prey to the trend that kind of came out a few years ago about sneaking and hiding. My personal opinion is anything that's built on deception is not going to last. So if you are trying to trick your kids into eating by, you know, putting spinach in their brownies and feeling that they're getting their spinach, it's, it's going to be problematic. But if you're doing something like you are and saying, okay, we're putting spin a little bit of greens in our smoothie and your kids are aware of it, so they know what's going in, even though they might not taste it, absolutely, go for that. Or if you put something in to test it out on them, and then they ate it, and they liked it, like, oh, I just put cauliflower in the spaghetti sauce, tell them after. You say, guess what? Actually, you do like cauliflower. We had it in there tonight. So they know. So they don't find out down the road that you were sneaking stuff in, and I can't trust mom and dad, and they're always trying to give sneak stuff to me. So just letting them know and that it's not a bad thing. And another... Um, just thought or philosophy that I have around that with getting kids to eat healthier is not making our the main meal like it's this purgatory to get through that's so hellish to get to dessert. So if there's if there's that that thing where just eat just eat just eat you're going to get dessert, it's never trouble to get a kid to eat sweets. I mean that's just you know you're not going to have to trick them into eating dessert. But you don't want to set up the foundation that dinner is so bad you just have to get through it. It's like it's it's great to eat this food. It tastes wonderful. We're excited about it and try and encourage them in that. Cuz if you're enjoying what you're eating, they're going to pick up on that too. So, so I got a time for uh, we're okay. Oh, she, so she was asking what I would line this with, parchment, paper, or foil, is there a difference? It's really up to you. You can use either one. I use the um, knot and dyed parchment paper, I'll line mine in. I use foil for certain things. It depends on what I'm, co what I'm cooking. If it's... Part of it is I try not to, I try and not use 
tons of foil in my life, so that's a personal thing. So, but there's some things that are just really gooey or gonna cook longer and parchment, they tend to get a little bit more crispy. So fish does um, fine on parchment. Uh, I will use foil if I have something that's super saucy that maybe has like a some sort of like saucy barbecue marinade or something like that, depending on what it is. But if you don't have one or the other in your house, they're interchangeable in that way. Don't say, oh, I can't line this with this or that. You can use either one. Anybody else? Yes. Okay, so in your pantry, she just asked what you recommend to have in your pantry if you want to eat something on the go. I actually, I would say let, from the pantry it's tough. So like cup of soup I would not recommend because it's so high in sodium. It may taste really good and it's really easy. So there's either two ways to go on that. Is sometimes if, I know Trader Joe's has some different organic frozen bowls like with chicken and rice and something like that that you could just, you're so exhausted, you can't think straight, you just need to do something like that if you're not gonna cook. Say it's something that you could keep in your freezer or a really good jar. Um, or a cup of soup, like not a cup of soup like the kind you add hot water to, but I mean the, uh, a can of soup or if there's some, there's some nice ones that actually come in glass jars. So a lentil soup or something that's got beans and protein that are really good for you and vegetables in it that you could just take, heat up, and be ready to go. Anybody else? Yes. So she just asked a question about having different cutting boards for meat, for vegetables, for fish. Um, if that's something that you want to do, you have the room in your pantry for, and that's important to you, then I say absolutely go ahead and do that. I don't personally do that myself. I mean, I have lots of cutting boards, but I don't keep track of which ones for which at my house. I, have, I just, I don't, I clean them well. Also, something else, I come from a more kind of old school way of thinking about certain things, so Julia Child time, meaning like if I'm doing chicken, I don't rinse my chicken off thinking I'm cleaning something off of it. There is nothing water that's gonna take off. You need to cook it. It's the heat that's gonna do that. So if you, my mother-in-law goes through this whole pageantry when she gets a chicken of washing it all down and then the stuff splatters, so she takes out the bleach and she cleans the entire kitchen with bleach afterwards. Like, I don't want all the chicken goo going all over my kitchen. I want to cook it and anything that needs to be, you know, that we shouldn't be eating, it's gonna be taken off with heat, not with water. Yes. Oh, often or you, that's, I thank you. Oh, yeah. So the question is about knives and sharpening them. Yes, if you, have an, if you own a, a good knife and it hasn't been sharpened in the last year, it's like the dusting thing with the spices, you need to get it sharpened. A lot of places, a lot of grocery stores have people who you know, do sharpening once a week, find out when it is. You can get... Uh, they have different sharpening things, but a lot of people have, do you know where the our sharpening thing is? Is it right there? No, it's not on here. I was gonna sh demonstrate if you have the knife, if you have a knife block, it came with the steel, which is that long piece of metal that probably just sits in your drawer and your kids might use as a sword or something. <laughs> like how to actually use that, because if you can do that regularly every you know time or two or three times before you use your knife and just run your knife along it, it will, um, yep. It will make a big difference. Hey, guys, will you grab the? I'll just show, do a quick. Uh, so this is. Um, you want to hit the edge of it. it. Makes a really pretty sound. So you want to run down and up and just drag it through, and it will make a big difference on how your knife is. So if you could do that a few times every time before you use your knife, your knives will stay sharper a lot longer and keep an edge on them. I'm pulling it an edge down and then I'm dragging it the opposite way. And everybody has, it's kind of like handwriting, like there's a technique to it, how you learn, but then you'll have your own bend towards it. I mean, you don't want to take the front, you don't want to go this way. So you want to keep it at an edge and then you want to drag it down against the steel and it'll make a bit, it'll make a big difference. 
Kassir. Okay. Yes? Sorry for being in the peanut gallery. <laughs> uh, so I have a question about oils. Uh, yes. So I typically use canola oil or maybe canola oil for like cooking and then the uh, olive oil like for sauteing or salad. But yes. So he was just asking about grapeseed oil versus canola oil versus olive oil. So grapeseed has a high heat point, so if you're and it doesn't have a flavor, a strong flavor. So if you want to use grapeseed oil, and a lot of um, chefs will use it for stir fry or things like that, because it's not it takes a high smoke point, so it could go up to a high heat, and it doesn't impart a flavor. With canola oil, you want to look for the same thing that you look for in an olive oil, which is cold press, it will say expeller pressed because there's a lot of different processing that changes um, the oil. So some of the bigger broad line, I think like, I, I don't know, I wanna say Crisco, but that's not right. We'll make a, um, a canola oil, but they're, it's kind of like the bad junk oils. There's different hierarchies in, in canola oil as well. So keep your eye out for that. And oh, did, did that answer your question? You know, it's still one of those oils that's there's it's a little bit controversial in one way or the other. So I I know extra virgin olive oil I trust and know because it's been being used for thousands of years and has so I use grapeseed oil in some things. I don't cook with it as as much. I fry in um, non-GMO rice bran oil. So the fryer at our restaurant, like with French fries or anything like that, I use um, non-GMO rice bran oil because the latest research has shown that that, ha that um, changes the least when it's heated up to that um, smoke point and that it, it's also, for me, from flavor-wise, it doesn't leave a funky flavor. So it used to be peanut oil was used a lot, but a lot of people have peanut allergies, so if you are, for some reason, going to invest in a deep fryer, <laughs> I recommend that oil. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to be here and to allow me into your worlds or your virtual worlds of your kitchen and what you have or what you don't have or what you're struggling with and sharing that with each other. And I, I really appreciate it. If you have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I'm going to be signing books for a little bit. And that's, oh, yeah. Oh, we have what? Yes. Oh. Yes, I want to, so how many people, oh, hmm, I don't know if you're going to, can we just call this true confessions and what happens in this room stays in this room and, <laughs> and on YouTube? Um, I want to, if you don't feel like answering, you don't have to, but how many people are in the kitchen um, over two hours a week? Two hours a week, yeah. The entire week, add it up. Did you add, like the minutes in the kitchen? Oh wait, because you, you guys have it divided into two things. Okay, uh, okay, Monday through Friday. How many of you guys in that added up Monday through Friday have more than an hour in the kitchen? Great, how many of you have less than 20 minutes? <laughs> okay, you see, you can see you are not alone. It's, it's divided. Okay, weekend, so more than an hour on the weekend. Less than a half hour on the weekend. So what I would love to see you guys try and do is even if you do five extra minutes a week, not a, a, a day, a week, if it's one thing this next week, if it's trying a new recipe, if it's one day, set a timer for five minutes in your kitchen. You will be shocked how much you can actually get done in five minutes. Like it's, it, it doesn't sound like a long time, but you can literally make an egg breakfast, clean up the pan, do that you can make probably 20 smoothies in five minutes if you had a, a smoothie party. It's, there's a lot of things that can happen in that amount of time that's going to start making a difference on the way that you feel, on the way your kids feel, and you'll just be building a stronger and healthier relationship with food. Thank you, guys. <laughs>